We're live. I think we're live, guys. Yay. We're live. <laughs> this is going to be the best energy <laughs> webinar we've ever had. Hi, everyone. Okay, we're just going to wait for people to join, for people to find the links, for people to be notified and, and join us on YouTube, on Facebook. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Earth Day every day, Tabitha says. And that's yeah. Right. Should, um, should be celebrating it every day. Uh, but, you know, if, if there's one day where you say, you know, maybe I'll do something extra day, it's today. Do it. Um, go on a little hike. Take your pets for a walk. Think about um, how you as a pet owner are impacting the environment, like what choices you're making, what better choices you could be making. Uh, and anyway, happy Earth Day. And we're super happy to have our amazing two guests here today, Tabitha Kisara and Trap King. Sterling Davis, a.k.a. Trap King. Hi. Hey, Hi. hey. Doing? Um, we have people trickling in from everyone. would love to hear you, um, where you're from. If you want to answer in comments, just tell us your name, your cat's name, where you're from. We really um, are always interested to see where you guys are tuning in from. Sometimes we have people from, from all across the US. Sometimes you have people from Austria, from Paris, uh, France. So I'm um, always excited. And um, I will kind of just introduce our two guests, now that they need much introduction, but I will. And then I will hop off and let them talk about TNR, about feral cats, um, what it means, what's a feral cat, what's a stray cat. And then we'll be answering a lot of your questions. Um, we had a lot of you guys uh, submit questions beforehand. So we'll kind of touch upon those first. Well, they will. Um, and we'll go, we'll go from there. Um, if you have any questions, Write them in, in the chat because they will be addressed. We've got plenty of time for Q&A. Any questions for Tabitha or Trap King? Um, but let me kind of introduce them, so, uh, introduce them uh, before, before we start so you all know um, what amazing experts we have here today, right? So we've got Sterling Trap King Davis. Uh, he's a so-called um, ration trapper. Uh, he gave up his music career for cats, you guys. I mean, a dream, dream person. Um, and in 2017, he also started his own nonprofit. Um, it's called Trap King Humane Cat Solutions, and all ticket proceeds from today. Um, some of you donated, some of you joined for free. Both are fine, but all ticket proceeds will go to Trap King's um, nonprofit, uh, which uh, focuses on educating, assisting, and doing TNR and community cat management work. Um, and then we have Tabitha Kisara with um, all the accolades and all the uh, amazing, amazing um, RVT, CCBC, KPA, KPA, CTP. She is a registered veterinary technician, uh, specializes in cat behavior, well, in pet behavior, um, with um, an ultimate goal of uh, just strengthening the bond between uh, pets and their owners and keeping cats and, and dogs and pets at home and not having to rehome them or, God forbid, euthanize them. She has her own company, Tropes and Patter. Uh, you can uh, find her online. You can hire her as your um, pet behavior consultant. She's fantastic. I will attest to that. And there we go. You guys, um, we're super excited about this. I'm going to hop off. And I know you have a lot to talk about, um, starting with, you know, what a feral cat is. But maybe you guys can just um, talk a little bit about how you started working together um, in the first place. Um, I will hop back on in a little bit. Um, thank you, everyone, again. Pop your questions in the comments and take it away. Thank you. Happy Earth Day, everybody, from me and Yeah. Sterling. Happy um, Earth Day. How did we meet Sterling? It, it, <laughs> we're like, we old, you guys. Um, right, right, right. <laughs> we, it was, I mean, we didn't been at like, well, before the pandemic. We were in we, the same, we would be at cat conferences together right. and we're both very extroverted. So we just connected. And we both happen to eat vegan. Right. And we went and to an like, amazing vegan spot. <laughs> yeah. We were like, we need to be friends. We love cats. We're extroverted. And then we would just hit each other up at conferences. And then we started talking in per like on the phone, like old school. And right. then we were like, oh my gosh, we teach a lot the same. We love, we're unicorns. We love kids, humans, and animals. And we started doing things together and became close friends. So we're all about doing as many things together as we can, and we are so stoked for Base Paws to have us to talk about community cats on Earth Day. Right, shout out Base Paws. <laughs> yes. So we were gonna just start by answering a few questions, addressing a few myths, and then I know some great questions came in already, and we'll have some more, which we'll definitely have time for, but I figured we would start with 
saying, because not everyone knows, Sterling, what right. is a feral cat? Right. So that feral cat, and there is a difference between feral and stray, but that feral cat is a cat. It's an outdoor cat, community cat. We like to call it community pets, community cats. They have different names, but the feral cat is just, it's not a stray. That's the cat that wants to be outside. You need to TNR that cat, and that cat's going to stay outside. Yeah, so a feral cat is essentially an unsocialized cat that is afraid of people because they haven't been socialized to them. We like to think of them similar to like a squirrel or a raccoon. They're awesome, but um, you don't want to put them in the house. <laughs> you don't put them in the house, and uh, you don't want to pet them, and that's totally cool. Um, and sometimes it can be really hard to tell the difference between a feral and a stray cat, and. I'm sure Sterling has heard me talk about this. I'm not a huge oh, fan yeah. of labels um, because I think a lot of cats are incorrectly identified as a feral cat. Um, and due to that, they get treated a certain way um, and they don't get a chance. Cause like a cat being terrified on arrival at a shelter is very different than feral. Um, so sometimes, but sometimes it can be hard to tell. So like Sterling said, feral cats tend to you tend not to see them. You tend not right. to know they're there. Um, yeah. When those stray cats, you're like, you're really, the, the feral cats are really well, well kept because they, they're used to living outside when that stray cat who's like coming up to you at your door, that cat's outgoing. Wants to see yeah. You. Um, because they're like, dude, I don't live outside. What's going right, on? Right. Right. <laughs> if you can see that cat, if it's walking up to you, chances are that's not a feral cat. If it's walking up to you, that's not a feral cat. Scared or timid, that's a different thing. But that's not a feral cat. If you're walking up to him and you didn't pet that cat, that cat is not feral. <laughs> and sometimes if you're not sure, that's where you, re there's a lot of great resources online. I have some resources on my website because again, sometimes it can be hard to tell a feral cat and a stray cat. And I work with a lot of rescues and I know Sterling does too. And we help to identify and assess, but usually it's all about assessing behavior and describing what we see instead of using those labels. Cause I think, cause people are like, I have five feral cats in my house and I'm like, and they, they are well socialized and, and I'm not throwing shade, but <laughs> that most likely means that those cats weren't feral. Right. Um, so there's different situations like some cats or kittens we rescue them from outside because they were in unsafe situations we get we get them like spayed and neutered and then socialize them and get them adopted but in some cases like sterling mentioned it's best to like let's provide them with let's spay and neuter them let's tnr them let's return them back to where they were and maybe provide some housing and some feeding in a well organized way. So not plates everywhere, or we're feeding at structured times, um, things like that. But your feral cats, you can love your feral cats. But and a lot of people say maintain too. A lot of people say TNRM, T trap, neuter, return, maintain, meaning maintain the colony. So yeah, that's that's the winter shelter houses when it's cold, things to that degree. And again, like feeding them. That's that's good. After a proper TNR program, you see a lot of people just leaving food out, but you want to properly do TNR before you do that. If you're just putting food out, then you're probably adding fuel to the fire or giving fuel to overpopulate and spread disease. And do you want to talk about, obviously TNR start, stands for trap new to return. Do you want to talk a little bit about TNR, Sterling? Yeah, I want to, you know, TN, okay, trap, neuter, return. So that is, that's the thing. And that's the humane alternative for euthanasia or death for stray and feral cat populations. So it's the process where cats actually, because I like to do demonstrations sometimes, but I actually have a humane trap right here. But it's the process where cats are caught in a humane trap so they're not hurt, taking the low cost spay neuter clinics where they're spayed, neutered, and vaccinated, and they're returned back to their colony and it prevents overpopulation and spread disease. I want to put emphasis on that R, that return, because a lot of people, and even back in the day, we would say release. It is extremely important that you return cats back to their colony. Um, cats, they're not. They're kind of territorial if you know about cats. So a cat in a new area, the other cats that's there, they like, who is this new guy over here? Like coming to steal mates and food? No, get out of here. So and a cat will probably more than likely if they're relocated like that improperly, they'll probably try to find their way back home. So it's real important with that R. Make sure you return them back to that colony. 
Yeah, and there are those cases where the places you return them it isn't safe. And again, those are not, he's calling his kitty up. Those are not ideal situations, but if there is a situation in which the R can't happen, there are ways you can transfer them to like new barn homes and things like that, but it's a lot more than just dropping the cat off there. Right, right. Which is why that's one of the things we, we understand in, in rare situations that's needed, but in most, it's all about returning them where they are because like Sterling said, cats aren't aggressive, but just like humans, if there are only enough resources, guys, and what I mean by that is like food, water, places to rest, just like in your house, if there are only enough for this, if they let another cat in, I know you might see it as them being like aggressive and territorial, but like they will die because there's only so many resources, which is why when you see cats in colonies, they can't just let every single cat in because there's only one puddle with water, for example. Right. Um, right, so right. there's so many benefits to TNR, like yeah. reducing euthanasia because just removing and euthanizing the cats, although that's something that people used to think was okay, we now know even if you don't like cats, TNR is a win-win for you because it means right. less cats. Right. <laughs> or if you love cats, it means a humane way to deal with those cats because just removing them and putting them other places can actually cause more issues and problems and then new cats just go to that area. So yeah. CNR comes in as a effective humane solution because some of these things are tricky and then also it reduces some of the nuisance behavior. So me and Sterling have worked with a lot of court cases and neighbor conflicts. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it could be something like my cat, the cat's marking on my, in my area. I'll be honest, every home I've been to where a person was complaining, cause I'm the mediator, where someone was complaining about cats defecating everywhere, it wasn't cat feces. But um, <laughs> again, that's why it's helpful to call people in that and be kind and not judgmental and help educate those people. Cause I know sometimes it could be hard as someone's neighbor who's not being as nice to that cat but then you could say, actually, this is this animal species, and here's a humane way to keep this out. So I could still, we could still offer solutions and not just say, bye. Um, but it reduces the fighting behavior between intact cats. Right. So none of us want that. It, it reduces the vocalization of our lovely intact cat. <laughs> are maybe possibly having some hormonal moments. Um, right. I've heard so many times where people are reaching out to me and they like the cats outside and every night they just fighting and I hear them and I'm like, you, we need to get some TNR started because guess what? They not fighting. <laughs> they not fighting. Well, there's things that people tend to complain about. So again, even people who may not love the idea of community cats, TNR is a win-win for everybody because it means less cats. Less right. kittens that we've all been at, at, in areas where you see, even if you don't love cats, no one likes to see cats dead on the side of the road or kitten. Right. That hurts all of us. So TNR is an, a great way to reduce that. And shelters can't take in these feral cats, which is- Can't handle common, all of them. <laughs> yeah, a common myth. Cause a lot of people are like, I'll just take the feral cat to a local shelter to be adopted and Adult feral cats are euthanized more frequently than any other animal. So, and I understand that. I don't, I'm not, again, it's all about understanding and empathy and not judging, but those shelters aren't in a place where they can, feral cats are unhandable. Like you right. Can, I'm going to give you these meds, man. It's going to be okay. <laughs> I deal with that so much. And I know it's coming from a good place. So many people are like, hey, they reach out and they're like, can you come TNR this cat? I want to get, well, not TNR. They want me to come get it so we can go to the shelter and get it adopted. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's great. Are you feeding the cat or what? Do you pick him up? Are you able to pet? And it's like, no, nah, I've never been able to pet it before, but I see it around and I really wish I could give it a home. And I go out there and this cat is not, <laughs> it's definitely feral, not able to go into a shelter or a rescue to get adopted. That's not going to happen. The best thing is TNR the kitty bring the kitty back like and i know people mean well because i hear it a lot and they like i know i just want to give it so pretty i want to give it a home and i'm like it'd be better outside and you could feed 
properly feed, not just leaving the food out, but feed the kitty. And um, that would help more than trying to get it adopted. Every cat cannot get adopted out. Yeah. And like that's not a bad thing. Right. In those situations, I think it's best to, as like someone that works with those kind of animals, or if you're a rescue, I say, you know, I empathize. You can help them assess if it is a feral cat or not feral cat, because so many people do have a lot of trouble with that. And it results in a lot of negative things uh, happening. So if it is feral cat, totally cool. We're going to help you create a housing situation that doesn't cause other cats to happen. We're going to give you feeding instructions. Feral cats tend, so do your cats in your home. They like their food and water away from each other and they like their shelter a little farther than that. Um, because cats are prey predator animals. And when we have, so if you have a housing situation for your feral cat, I love that, but maybe don't keep the food, water and the shelter right there because right. prey predator animal, all the resources are in one place. And that feral cat is going to be like, I ain't going in that house. <laughs> so right. you know, spread. And that's where behavior is really cool. Cause like I could just spread it out a little bit. When I feed colonies, I know it's a little thing, but I give each plate. A, a few feet apart because cats actually right. enjoy eating together and that's going to reduce the tension and so, social competition. So there's, again, we can help you keep that feral cat happy, help you monitor, especially if it's in your yard. I'm a huge fan of like monitoring your feral cat's health. Um, if it's a cat in your yard, obviously every yeah. situation is different. Sometimes it's, we see these cats, we treat TNR, we return them, which is amazing. And then we go back to our lives, which is still great. But if they're in your backyard, you can identify which cats you have. Me and Sterling have worked with a lot of organizations about starting cat TNR programs, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. But yeah, TNR is awesome. I uh, also w didn't mention a tip. Yes, <laughs> so didn't mention the tip. T <laughs> TNR, TNR, once, once the cat is spayed, neutered, vaccinated, and returned back to his or her colony, they receive an ear tip similar like the logo. And the reason that we do that is so that we can identify the cats that have been through the TNR process. It is extremely dangerous if you catch a cat, uh, put it on the table to be sedated and be fixed, and then the same week you catch that same cat, not cool. So you'll see the ear tip that lets you know that the cat has been spayed, neutered, vaccinated, and they're good to go. They are a community cat. Don't hurt them. Don't mess with them. They're good. Right. And that actually helps elected officials because we see a lot of things like feeding bans and other things try to get into law. And that's where it's all about education. We go to those. I go to city meetings. Sterling does, too. And I listen. And then I provide those people with education because feeding bans don't work. They're super counterproductive because you can't you can't monitor that. The, no. the cops don't have time for that. Also, no one can monitor that correctly. People are still going to be feeding the cats. And then if those cats are used to being fed and no one sees them, now that that was taken away all of a sudden, now they're going to be on garbage cans. Now right. in their car or the weird things that we occasionally hear. Um, so feeding bans aren't very helpful. But I'll be honest, like usually when someone goes to their city to complain, it's because of one complaint of someone leaving cans or paper plates, which I know we keep pushing the be clean thing, but literally one person does that. One person goes to the city council and then we're fighting a feeding band or something. Right. Intense. So it's so important to feed them at their scheduled times that helps with trapping as well, but also so you can monitor your cats in your colony and then see if they're all still there, all that fun stuff, but then also clean up when you're done. Please, um, please clean up. Please that's clean up. The reason why we see <laughs> some some things like feeding bans and other things that are counterproductive and actually harmful and aren't super beneficial for our tax money and, and other things. That's probably the number one reason we see those things happen because of mess. Not because right. of cats, because of the mess of the paper the paper plates and stuff. So huge thing. So and that's how possums and raccoons end up in my traps too. And oh, <laughs> when yeah. I'm trying to catch cats, <laughs> leaving yes, that food do out, not, do not want attract to. everything in the neighborhood. I have caught many possums, many raccoons, even a groundhog. So you're attracting everything in the neighborhood when you don't clean up. Make sure you clean up. And that ear tip prevents, like like Sterling said, it prevents me from because trapping is 
a stressful experience, even though there are some things you could do to make it low stress, um, as low stress as possible. But if that cat already went through that, you don't want to put that through that then that again. So that lovely little ear tip is just a nice way because we can't necessarily, we could microchip them, but you couldn't necessarily go up to that feral cat and scam that cat. <laughs> and if we gave them a tattoo, again, you couldn't necessarily, I'm going to just yeah. you know, you, pick you up and check your belly real quick. Let's see that green so, tattoo you got there. Nah, and that's where your because also collars can get stuck. So a lot of people, there's a common myth that ear tips can be painful or harmful. When done appropriately, they're done under anesthesia and safely and only a small part of the ear is clipped off so this isn't being done to your cats while they're well to feral cats while they're awake uh pain meds are implemented all of that good stuff is done and it's the best way to see from far away so we just wanted to address that a lot of people are like do we have to tip their ears we love our ear tip cats right <laughs> just a be, right right just a little bit just a tip <laughs> and then another common myth which me and sterling can talk about forever Oh and I'm goodness. sure about I, to say it. there's more I'm about to say. Uh, <laughs> there's a few questions that we'll actually address after too. But anyone can socialize a feral cat with a lot of time and patience. Um, so this is something that's very close to both of our hearts. I actually teach socializing feral cats for a living. Um, but that is a myth. Not anyone can socialize any feral cat. Because for many community cats, indoor homes are not an option because they are not socialized to live with humans. And actually, if you bring them in a cage into a shelter or into your home, from a behavioral standpoint and a emo physical, emotional standpoint, that cat is actually suffering because they are panicking. If they are truly a feral cat, you can't just be like, it's cold outside, I'm gonna bring you in my bathroom because they're gonna go in your ceiling or, and again, you want what's like well-meaning people do it because sometimes people don't know what a feral cat is and they are bless their souls. They bring in the cat in their house and then they call me or Sterling because the cat is in their ceiling right. or the cat broke through a window um, or the cat stuck in their basement. And we work together to do the best at that moment. But in the future, when that happens, we're going to educate that person on what a community cat is and how to handle that in the future. Right. Because unfortunately, not every feral cat can be socialized, and that's okay, guys. Right. Everybody, so many people want to be up to see the kitty, take it in, love it. I know, I know, I feel the same way. I had before, back in the day, I had a house, and I promise you it was a cat in every room because I wanted to help every cat I saw. So I know people want to do it, but please, no, you can't. Every cat cannot. That is a serious myth. Every cat, feral cat, cannot be socialized. So. Yeah, we need Please. to make sure with that. We need uh, to, yeah. <laughs> and again, it's, 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 we, me and Sterling love humans because we know that all these people are coming from such a wonderful place. But also, especially as a behavior consultant and a technician, I know the emotional state of how those cats are, are and their quality of life is not good inside. So right. you, you're maybe humanizing the cat and like creating a narrative on how the cat feels, but actually the cat, is living in a basement and never comes out. Guys, that's not that's not normal. That's not a good quality of life when their quality of life is happier outside. Now, when it comes to socializing feral cats, it can be done. <laughs> and I actually have a lot of resources on my website that you can download for free that talk all about this. They're usually more focused on kittens um, because usually kitten cats key socialization period, which just means this is the time in their lives when they're learning things, they're bonding with their parents, they might get startled, but they recover easily. It's very easy to just pair scary things with good things, but that's only two to seven weeks, guys. Right. <laughs> um, and then we usually say, and a lot of the larger organizations say up to 14 weeks. And at that point, kittens, yes, it is a little easier to socialize them at that age, you still should be doing behavior modification. I use a lot of clicker training techniques. And instead of the whole, like, I love you, I'm going to squeeze you. Um, what is the Elmira from Tiny I mean, Tools? Elmira I'm going to hug you and squeeze you. Remember, you love I love you and squeeze. And then the poor cat's body language. It's a cartoon right. cat. And the cartoon cat's like averting their gaze. And like, trying please, to please. <laughs> so if I was like, how could you socialize a fearful kitten or a feral kitten? 
the biggest thing I would say is it's the last thing you should be doing is physically touching them. Um, usually clicker I, training, like you said, is amazing. Yeah, clicker I love it. So amazing. And you build a bond with the cat because a lot of things I see, it's all about interacting with the cat, touching the cat. You guys are triggers to the cat because they're not socialized. So you're doing something called flooding, which means if you were afraid of something, you're exposed to it full force. So if you were afraid of spiders, I throw, hopefully none of you are, um, I throw you in a closet full of spiders. Not only are you still going to be scared of spiders, but you're going to you might be scared of this tattoo after that. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> you're going to to other things. We didn't even set that up. Um, so when it comes to kittens, flooding tends to be hold them, put them in a hoodie and take them everywhere. That's way too much stimuli, you guys. And you're not as assessing their body language. We should be assessing their body language keeping them in a place where they're showing no to minimal signs of stress. And you'd be surprised when you work with the kitten at their pace, how much more quickly they, they do versus because what happens when we force and flood and hold and what happens is they go to their new home or you move them to another room and then they resort back to worse than they were when you first had them. So one huge message me and Sterling like to talk about is let's stop flooding kittens. Please stop yes. it. I know you, I know they're cute and cuddly, but like I said, like we were saying, clicker training and things of that degree are amazing. Um, whistle training, I do whistle training and clicker training with my girls, um, which is they do different tricks, learn to sit pretty. It's fun, it's a way to bond. And once you interact and work with them, you'll see it. They love it, they love to get it right, they love to know they got it. Like my, my girl Demita, she I taught her to ring a bell, which was good and bad because right. <laughs> in the middle of the night it's just bing, 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 bing. And I'm like, okay, I gotta I gotta pick that bell. I gotta hide it. <laughs> and that's why we have to think about what we do. <laughs> right, like, right. He's so cute. So oh, someone asked about clicker training. So clicker training is just where you use a clicker, like a marker. Um, which do I have one on? Let me my see. Desk? I may have one myself. I know, Y'all, I just cleaned my desk. So, do you have one? Yeah. yeah, I got one here. I got my amazing Acro Cats oh, okay. clicker. So, so it's can you it for me, Sterling. Perfect. So, which every cat, my cat, my girls is like, oh, wait, what? They're going to be like, you better reinforce me. So, <laughs> clicker training is basically a form of positive reinforcement training where the clicker works as a marker. So, basically, if you just say, sit, come, I love you. The cat or dog don't know what y'all saying. <laughs> um, so the clicker is a really great way to communicate, to teach your cat to communicate and how to understand them. Because for example, if I'm teaching a cat to touch a target with their nose, when they touch their target with their nose, I click with the clicker like a camera and the cat understands that that's the criteria I wanted. And then I give them a reinforcement, which could be play, food, pets, toys, um, and basically by having that clicker, because a click sounds the same for me, from Sterling, from right. a five-year-old, from a hundred-year-old. So I'm all about using the word good or a marker word, but that can sound different coming from different people. So we really like the clicker. Basically they click and that's a way for the cat to understand that's the behavior I wanted. So we can communicate with the cat. And they all are still right here so like... You better give them treats. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. That was my bad. It's um, all good. Because we teach them that the clicker is called the secondary reinforcer. And what that all means right. is we click and we give a reinforcer. So we teach them that when you click, something good happens. Kind of like money, right? If money tomorrow didn't mean anything, it wouldn't be valuable to us. It's a secondary reinforcer because of, of what we buy with it. So that's why when, it, when I saw Sterling click, I was like, you better reinforce them. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> You don't want to break that, um, but you can use clicker training to help cats. Basically, the goals of socialization is, is for kittens to come up to you on their own. Right. Um, for kittens to come up to you on your, their own, for kittens to be comfortable with new things, like new textures, new people. And we use clicker training to help build a relationship and communicate with them at a distance. Because again, then we work up to, we start with play, Maybe some picnicking, which is where you pick a time per day, every day, and you give the cat, you go in, you don't talk to the cat. They don't like it, most of them. Um, I know it's hard for us, y'all. Um, you use considered approach, so you use the side approach. You 
don't talk. You place a treat down, super delicious, churro, whipped cream, something really good, and then you leave. It's just yeah. a predictable, consistent human interaction. And maybe the first day they don't eat it. That's okay. Then the second day they eat it as you're leaving. Then the third day they eat it. They're out of their hidey place and they're waiting for you to give it. That Then we're ready to add a clicker because – because right. with cat with really really fearful cats a clicker is a loud sound so we have to build a relationship for for with them first um so many awesome and a le and clicker training just like the whistle training what it is like y'all saw i mean i wish i could put this camera down and show y'all how they ran in here but it's good too because as you see they came running in so if you ever have an emergency or going to a vet you know, whistle training and clicker training to be able to make that noise or blow that whistle and your cats come running. It makes it a lot easier uh, going to the vet or if you in case of an emergency situation, if you want to hurry up and get out the house, you got to put them in the carrier. You don't have to run around with your carrier like floofy, floofy, get the trap, get the trap, get the trap. And they running around and you running around. If you could just click that or blow a whistle and they come, it is awesome like i said if y'all could see them they they are still You're here really I, i'm like i'm trying to i'm trying to slide and drop treats <laughs> that and that's a really great point so like if you do have a colony that you feed me and sterling are big fans of adding a cue which is basically what he said kind of like a whistle or a word that indicates something good's gonna happen so for example every time you feed you say feeding time or you ring a bell and like he said, you you basically are teaching them a recall. So they come to you, they come out of their hiding places, they get fed, they get reinforcement. But when you do that every day, you could practice sometimes and just ring the bell on times that aren't their feeding times and then give them reinforcers like maybe right. treats. But then like if you need to catch your, if you have a sick cat in your colony and you want to, or if you think your cats are missing, you can... Mm back them out you can get them to go into the traps easier because you you guys are already feeding your cats all the time just right. you and what i mean by cue like a, a bell or a whistle shake the bag shake yeah, that shake bag that. i've seen a lot of colony feeders come out and shake that bag house. <laughs> but it shouldn't be a sound you use for other things because then the cats will get confused but totally start doing that i love that you mentioned that certainly yeah, so absolutely. we were going to talk about before we answer some questions because there's so many great ones some tips on oh, yeah. catching cats because i know it can be difficult and i know someone asked about what do you do because a lot of places a lot of the places are starting to open back up with the pandemic things have been hard for everybody uh, a lot of spay and neuter clinics were closed due to a variety of reasons beyond our control and their control okay. and sometimes you're like i can't just walk in anytime when i have caught this kitty um, so that's where these kind of tips can come in handy. So I'm going to have Sterling mention his favorite baits. Oh, yeah. A lot of those. <laughs> and well, can you explain what bait is? One, I mean, first of all, my favorite bait is mackerel. Jack mackerel, like, is, is smells. Like, I don't, we don't eat meat. So for me, it's kind of bad. But, <laughs> but for the cats, they love it. It's like a butter. fishy smell. They smell it for miles like i love jack mackerel um chicken believe it or not i have trap cats with kfc <laughs> and they love it so it's usually something they can smell when i do kfc i usually do it a little warm so some smoke coming off of it so the smell of travel uh jack mackerel they smell that for miles away because it's just too much and of course cat food too you could use cat food but i like to switch up the baits i, I like to switch up different baits because a lot of times too it's good to switch your bait because they'll recognize that smell with you so i've had a lot of cats i'm coming through and i keep using that mackerel so when they smell it they like wait a minute i know that's that bald dude coming and i don't really like when he come through so i'm gonna i smell that mackerel i'm gonna get out of here so i like to switch up the baits go to chicken cat food I, i'll probably start off with whatever the colonies feeder, feeders are feeding them and then work my way up to different baits um another tip is where you place the traps too man i've seen people just <laughs> put a trap right in the middle of the <laughs> like all out in plain sight and everybody's standing around looking like <laughs> i like to try to put the trap somewhere hidden some somewhere where they feel safe because the cat you know they private they don't when have you had seen cats mating you don't really because they're very private so <laughs> they you want to put the 
trapped somewhere where it's kind of hidden, concealed, where they feel safe and they can go in there. Because it's a it's a traumatic situation as is. So you want to make it easy as possible. Make sure you're covering those traps when you're done. When the kitty goes in, make sure you cover that trap. I've had a lot of kitties. They get scared because it's a traumatic situation. You think if you going to get something to eat. And the door slam and the lights go out. You like what in the world? <laughs> you would be scared too. So it's a traumatic situation for them. So you want to try to make it as easy as possible. So having the trap in an area that's not really as busy and kind of concealed, and then um, make sure you cover that thing. Cover that trap up. Camouflaging is a really helpful thing to like. Me and Sterling have had a lot of success with those lawn bags. We would put we put the cat trap in the lawn bag and set it up. Yeah. It's a nice cats like bags, you guys, and lawn bags are the best size. Um, so that's a great way to conceal a trap. Or sometimes, obviously, if we have bushes or trees, we're not going to put it in the middle of the parking lot <laughs> necessarily. Right. Then, again, even these are feral cats, so they're unsocialized. But even a non-feral cat isn't going to be like, "What's up?" Like, yeah, yeah, in the middle and not see what's happening. So. I think it's really important to camouflage and you could, I've done things where I've grabbed bushes and sticks from my yard and put it on the trap to make it more yeah. camouflage. And that can be helpful sometimes in areas where you may not want people to mess with the traps. I'm, lo I'm looking for this. Oh, here it is. Oh, did you? Another, another, this is great. <laughs> this is a great thing. Like one of the things that I do with traps, drop traps is I have an app just with cat sounds so oh yeah that's a good tip and again i'm my cat's gonna kick my butt all these sounds <laughs> i'm making here but they all looked up and they got curious a lot of times you know they say curiosity killed the cat that has helped me out a ton of times um and another tip i for and this may be i don't know a lot of people still use the regular traps but if you got if you get into drop traps that's like the if you ever see the Acme Roadrunner thing and they got the box with a stick and they pull the string and the stick and the box, <laughs> it's something like it's similar to that. But using a drop trap, one of the things that I've learned that, that works amazing is actually catnip or silver vine. Uh, silver vine is like catnip on steroids, but this helps with a drop trap in ways. And I've done this because you may have a cat with a mouth injury and maybe they're not as motivated by the food. So using silver vine, which is like I said, strong catnip, I've had cats that I couldn't catch with any type of bait, and I used this, put the silver vine down, and they went under that trap and rolling around doing all of this, and I'm like, wow, I it wasn't even food. And for situations where, like me, you catch possums <laughs> and raccoons, I've caught like eight possums in one night, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not trapping with food more tonight. Like this is crazy. So. The catnip, the silver vine, and the drop trap. That's another amazing tip that I've recently been using, especially if, like I said, uh, injured kitty who probably isn't that interested. No, in that. And dental disease is very, very common, guys. Right. And some cats will create a. I love that he mentioned you should switch up your bait. I'm a huge fan of giving them different, like if you have a colony or if you're trapping somewhere. I'm going to feed you your normal food and then occasionally I'm going to give you some whipped cream or some mackerel and it doesn't only come out when you trap. Like me and Sterling, if we're going somewhere, obviously, or if you're going somewhere, you may not be able to create that. But a lot of us have relationships where we trap. We're familiar with the cats. So occasionally offer those treats when trapping isn't happening because guys, it's called classical conditioning. Cats are awesome. And just like humans, they are always learning. Like, like he mentioned, like they smell that macro and they're like, peace. Yeah, yeah. Like I know that dude. <laughs> he, and again, Sterling didn't do it on purpose. He, but he created a negative association because those cats are like, that smell happens. And then I go in a scary thing. Right. So it's good to offer that if you have the chance at different times. And then also, I love the silver vine and the drop traps because a lot of cats who've had, again, negative experiences it's kind of like cat carriers if they've had a really traumatic experience again not maliciously in most cases with a trap and let's say you have to because i deal with a lot of people that need to catch the cat after they've been spayed or neutered due to a severe medical issue and the cat has an aversion to the trap 
So then they're like, well, what do I do? And the drop trap is a wonderful option, which is basically, we always recommend staying in the area, never leaving a trap by itself, just because no, lots <laughs> yeah. of things happen. That's just a big old no. Right. Um, so, but the drop traps are nice because they look different than the other traps. So the cat most likely won't have a conditioned res emotional response to it. But then also you kind of have a string or something like that. And you just chill in the bushes, listen to yeah. a podcast or something. And then you pull it down and they're a lot more, it's, it looks more safe to go into because it's more open. So if you have a cat that's hard to catch, that's a great tip. And then another tip, because I'm a behavior nerd, I train cats to happily accept the trap. Um, so yeah, you heard me because a lot of us have colonies and your cat's sick and less, less these people. They're like, I want to get this cat to the vet. First, I have to find a vet. That's another good point. Not all vets are familiar with how to treat and deal with fearful or feral cats. So first, like, it's all about teamwork and making relationships. Like me and Sterling work with so many different people. I have so many amazing vets and rescues and just trappers that I work with who are like amazing at what they do. So if you're into trapping, build relationships with those vet clinics now. Be aware of what your vet's comfortable with because some vets aren't comfortable. Like I'm a technician that works with both feral cats and home, like resident socialized oh, cats. Yeah. But they're, they're very different and not everyone is experienced with that. So even if you trap that cat, you can't then just bring it up to your vet because your poor vet is going to be like, whoa, we are not. Oh, and yeah, I wanted to say this too because I saw somebody saying that, um, asking about, you know, the trouble with trapping during the pandemic. So you want to, like, I have this cat here. One of the things you could do is what we were just talking about. If you haven't, because the pandemic has made it difficult. But like Tabitha have been saying, like we've been talking about, you can actually feed in the trap. And that helps if you have a colony. And a lot of times I have this trap here. I'm going to try to set it up. I hope y'all can see it. Give me a second because I like doing demos. <laughs> <laughs> I told him to bring his trap, y'all. So let me see if I could. So the trap here, this door, this door on the trap, what you could do is, is prop this door open. This is the door that they walk in originally. So they'll, you know, when you set the trap, they walk in this door. That's what they see. But what you can do is, is if you have a colony, wherever you have a colony at, get them used to the trap by feeding inside the trap. So you could use anything like a soda bottle or anything. Or stick to keep it open so it doesn't yeah, to, fall. Yeah. Right. To keep it open. And you put the food in here in the back and they get used to, and nothing happens. So they go in there and eat nothing and happens. they come back out. Nothing happens. So you... You're getting the cat used to actually going inside the trap. That way, if you feed in there and they get used to the trap. Oh, wait, I can't hear you, friends. When you get used. Oh, oh sorry about that. When you you're get, good. Once they get used to the trap, then it's easier. So if you want to, like, like I said, scheduling is tough. So if you have that, if you're doing that, then you can pretty much pinpoint when you'll be able to do it because they're used to going in there so when the clinic and the vets are ready you can be hey I'm, i know i'm gonna have at least two or three a day because they go into traps and eat and it makes the process a lot easier even outside of the pandemic i would recommend that because it's, it's it's really good and you already feed in the colony got some traps definitely feed them in there and get them ready for tnr just like with your cat carriers leave them in your house where you hang out because most people bring their cat carriers out of their basement. The cats only see it once a year. And then we're like, why does the cat hate this? And it's uh, like the cat hears bad theme music yeah. when you bring the carrier. It's like, no, 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 no. Right, legit. <laughs> so that's that's something. I have a handout on my website that goes step by step how to basically we're training the cat to happily accept the, the trap. And sometimes, like Sterling said, you could keep it in there. If that's too much for that cat, you can start, basically, I start the traps here, I'll start a foot away, and then every day I move it an inch or so closer until I'm in the cage. And then once the cat is comfortable going in and out, you pause, even if the cat has, once they are trapped, they do have a negative association, they've had more positives with it. So then if you have to trap them in the future, it's not stressful, which is like, we know how it is when you have a sick feral cat and we're all struggling and we can't get them and we're worried about, because 
we want to be as low stress as possible. And I highly recommend everyone train. If you have a colony or, or work at a rescue with a lot of feral cats in the same area, train them to their traps. It makes a humongous difference. Yes. Um, you oh. Can also, oh, go on. I wanted to say this before we go into questions too. I know we like they, know, baseballs. Baseballs is like we should, have never <laughs> we should have never started them. We shouldn't have got them started. But seriously, no, this is another one because we we talked about uh, T and R being returned, the R being an, a big important thing with relocating in the you know last option thing where you feel like you need to relocate a cat you. Proper acclimation units. I really want to say that. I've had people say, hey, we're going to relocate a cat. And I'm like, good, that's awesome. And then I'm like, What's, where at? You go, And they're like, oh, I'm going to relocate it over here on the street. The best place is a barn where they could be worker cats. And you need a proper acclimation unit. This is something that's outdoors, like something where they could like go super inside. Large dog yeah, kennel super or... large. Yeah, like a super large dog, dog kennel. They can go in there and they, they get used to the sights, the sounds, and the smells of that area. This is meant for them to stay in there for weeks so they can get used to the area, the barn that they're at, and get properly acclimated. But you can't, if you just go let that cat go and think you should just, just go to a barn and let the cat go, you think you relocated it. No, that cat is trying to get back home. Right, Alana? She is she yes, like, this she, is about me. She seconds what her dad is saying. <laughs> right. She was, this was actually a TNR fail, I guess you could say. I was setting a trap and she was like, no, I'm coming with you. Like, she was trying to jump in my arms while I'm setting a trap. She's like, like, dad, I'm a stray. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm feral. <laughs> She's beautiful. Thank you. Say thank you, Alana. <laughs> Gorgeous. So, you guys, we, uh, this was so insight. It is so insightful. I'm learning a lot. Can associate with a lot of it, especially with the arachnophobia part. Thanks for you know. Sorry. Bringing I don't care about my hair too. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, I um, I wanted to get to some questions because yes. you talked about how to identify a feral stray. Um, kind of, you talked a lot about how to trap. Like really, really excellent information. I think we should put it into like a little carousel and post it as a post. Um, you know, on our social media. But then how about the part where you actually go and have the cats fixed, right? Could you discuss that? There's a lot of people who asked about how to fundraise, how to even start a TNR program. Um, could you address maybe the, you know, the medical parts where, you know, you have to take the cats to the vet to have them um, spayed or neutered? How, so to find, how to find an organization, where, where you go, who to, who to contact? And that's, that's a great question. I think there's a lot of different organizations who will offer you the red traps to you. So if this is something you just have a cat in your yard and you're not going to do it all the time, still awesome. But you can rent and get traps borrowed from a lot of your local shelters. And if you were talking about creating a TNR program in your neighborhood, which both of us have done, there are so many great resources. HSUS, Humane Society of the United States, has a municipal TNR. It's a whole catalog book that goes over ways to get some laws changed and some great ways to get started. Goes way more in depth than we have the time for today, but right. I highly recommend getting that. But the first thing I would do is find the rescues, meet the people in your area who are doing TNR, make relationships with them. With build the colony feeders too. Yeah, build relationships. Feeders. Sometimes, bless them. They they love feeding, but they're hesitant or unsure about spay and neuter because of some common myths or narratives. That again, they're doing the best with what they know in the moment. Um, I truly believe that. But that's where you can try to educate them and say this is actually going to help the cat. This is why that when it comes to Spay and neutering as a technician who's worked in a spay and neuter clinic, like Sterling said, you bring them into the clinic. Usually you have a walk in time between one to two hours, or you can make scheduled appointments, but there's only so many technicians. So usually there's set amounts. Some shelters have scheduled times you can go and you could just say, every Monday I get three appointments. And if you don't catch those three cats, I have four other friends that I could text to say, yo, if you got cats, there's appointments open here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. building those relationships and communicating with other people, working together, and then they go to the shelter, they go usually to a feral cat room, 
So usually we have a closet with no lights, with calming music. Again, they shouldn't be with the other cats because this is hard for everybody, but we want to make it as low stress as possible. We give them an IM injection, which means inter intermuscular. Because of course, I can't just be like, hi, kitty, I'm going to catch you and give you an IV drug, which means in the vein. So right. we literally, we do it very quickly. It's a skill, which is why you have to find veterinary professionals who are aware of how to do this, because this isn't something we're all taught. We give them an IM injection in their butt muscle usually, but we can give it in other muscles. And then they get sedated. Then we prepare them, like we get them sterile for surgery. We shave their areas that are needed. We get them intubated. Some cases they don't intubate, neuter male cats because of the procedure so short. Every place is different. We get them on anesthesia. We do the surgery. They recover with us because hypothermia being very cold is a very mm -hmm. common thing. So that's something that, that they do at the spay neuter clinic. And then they call you guys on recovery. And usually within 24 to 48 hours, we have the, the people who are taking the cats release them. And when it comes to when to do that, if the cat is panicking, even with a spade, because that is a very invasive surgery, which is a female yeah. surgery. Um, if the cat is panicking and is running around and is respiratory rate, they're breathing very, very quickly. It's going to be best to let them out earlier because that stress is going to delay their wound healing. Right. Chill in your setup, not your house, but wherever you have, then you can give it 24 to 72 hours. So people ask me in Sterling a lot how to choose that. And it's, again, I'm going to say it over. It's all about the individual <laughs> cat. Yeah, you got to pay attention to it. I mean, I can, I can generalize and say maybe, you know, with males, it's a lot different. The surgery is a little different, 24 hours. But again, like Tabitha said, if you got to pay attention. You want to be able to see the cat, see what it's going through. And if they panic and like that, yeah, sometimes you may have to release earlier because it's, it's probably best. But you definitely want to make sure they are healed. And before we go into a bunch of behavior related questions, which is always the hottest topic, um, is there an overarching organization in the United States um, or, or an institution that, um, or like a website where people can find feral friendly cat clinics? You know, there's fear free, there's feline friendly clinic, like veterinarians, but no, is there- That's a really great question. And I'll be honest, that, that isn't a thing. Uh, <laughs> I have, I've created, so uh, in my own city, I'm from Ohio, I created, because I'm fear-free and low stress, and even with feral cats, I think a lot of people can say they're comfortable with them, but I want them to truly be comfortable with them, just because a lot of bad things can happen on both both sides. So I've compiled a list of, of vet and facilities that are comfortable with it. So unfortunately, someone should do that, uh, a statewide database. But right now there isn't one, which is why I think a lot of the first steps is finding out who in your area can do it, building those relationships, getting traps, Alley Cat Allies and Neighborhood yeah. Outreach. Yeah, those are two. And then Sterling has some great resources too. On basic, like, because I know it sounds like everyone knows what TNR, the, I didn't, I was a vet tech yeah. I didn't know what TNR was 10 years I've been, ago. I was a cat guy my whole yeah. life. Love cats, always had them. I didn't, did not know TNR mm -hmm. about 10, 11 years ago. I didn't know what it, I, if you asked me what TNR was, I would have been like, that's the new dance, right? <laughs> do the, do the <laughs> TNR. <laughs> oh, now we have to do that. Uh, so, okay, so let's, um, we'll have someone pop in all these links. So you've got Chirps and Chatter, and you've got those resources on your website, Tabitha. We've got Alley Cats. Um, we've got Trap Kings, um, Trap Kings website. Um, TrapKingHumane.org. TrapKingHumane.org. We've got the is it outreach, community of outreach. Uh, neighborhood outreach. Neighborhood outreach. Um, and then um, I suppose it it depends on state laws, right? I know, or even lo local laws. I know in Los Angeles, um, just at the end of last year, um, LA City Council confirmed funding um, for TNR. It was like a long battle from what I've heard. So um, I suppose we would kind of recommend everyone, regard, depending on where you're from, to check your local local organizations because it's um, it's all about, you know, having the contact with your local organization, like you said, colony feeders, and then make those connections because unfortunately there's no um, overarching institution. And finding out your laws and fighting for them if yeah. you're comfortable, because not everyone's a public speaker, 
but I go to a lot of city council meetings and I, because I, I hear things as a vet tech, they're like, the cats are going to cause disease and this, and people are just right. spewing out stuff. And then I come up there with data and research. Facts. And, calm. <laughs> um, and again, I'm not judgmental. And I provide, and I've had so many city council people come up to me after and say, thank you so much. Can I have more of those resources? So being calm and civilized, if you're too over threshold to talk about something at a meeting, because I get it, guys, it's emotional. Maybe that's not the best place for you to be because this sounds rough, but I've been to a lot of these city council meetings. And if you're screaming and crying, trust me, I cry all the time. But if you're screaming and crying in that context, I'm not going to be listened to. And then it's going to be harder for someone like me to go in there and educate those people. So it's all about not shaming, being kind, meeting people where they're at, which is, I know it's cliche, but it does make a really big difference. That's why it's good to work together. Working together is a good thing, especially going out, whether you're trying to change laws or whatever you're doing with it, you want to work together. Some Somebody may be good at communicating with people. Somebody probably just good at with the cats and the traps and don't want to talk to people. But you definitely need to talk to people because you take it from me. I didn't, I, I, when I first started, I would just jump out the van, traps. I'm just trapping this neighborhood. And people would be like, uh, what is this dude doing? Who is this guy? So you want to educate the community and... um. Team up, team up, team up with people. The more people you get involved, the more you go and talk, the easier it is to uh, start a TNR program and get it done properly. Don't be afraid of flyers either. Passing out yeah, flyers. Yeah, burner hangers where you just awesome. go, so you're not going up into people's houses and knocking right. and stuff. You just put a doorknob hanger. There's a lot of templates out there for free, and it says, hi, I'm trapping in your area. This is what TNR is. This is what the vacuum effect is. So it's a very quick thing that they could read. So then if they see some tattooed, colored hair pasty chick in their neighborhood, um, they won't, cause again, I'm very kind, but I also can understand people's concerns. Um, so I'm very friendly, um, but <laughs> I don't, I want right away we're starting a dialogue too. So they might be like, what the heck's a community cat? And they might Google it. So that's a really great way to get started that even if you're not a super people person, cause you could just put a little thing in the mailbox. It's nothing excessive and it just says, Hey, I'm here. If you don't like cats, this helps. If this, if you like cats, this helps. Yeah. So we're right. both parties because so right. there's both parties. I know yeah. that. And you know, facts and data, just like information, like real life facts and data that always helps. And and people can find that on on uh, both of your websites. Mm -hmm. um, so now we kind of covered the institutional technical parts. Now let's go into some more behavior related questions. Um, Catherine is asking about the situation where she believes there's only one feral cat. Is it worth bringing her into the into the rescue and socialize? So context is everything, right? So I would need a lot more information to be able to assess that. So it's probably stray, right? Not feral, right? Right. If it and that's where first things first, like like Sterling said, let's assess the situation. So sometimes I'll have rescues get videos at a bar so I can help assess, and then that rescue is better at assessing in the future. It's like this beautiful thing. So I think if there is only one feral, is the cat feral or is the cat fearful or is the cat in pain? I see a lot of grumpy cats. Let's stop calling, let's stop saying that for Tabitha's sake. Grumpy cats are painful cats, everybody. Um, mm -hmm. so I see a lot of cats who are labeled fractious or feral when actually they're painful. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see Catherine saying he's fearful. He's feral. Okay. So in that case, it depends because you said into your rescue. I'm not sure what your rescue situation is when it comes to socializing a feral, a feral cat. Usually if they're past that 16 week age, it's not impossible, but it's a, you need a lot more experience. Um, time. Yeah. So you need a lot more experience and time. And that's where I would utilize the resources I have on my website where I would have a, like the first part of my feral kitten socialization handout goes over creating a safe environment, which is usually an environment away, which not everyone has. So like in that rescue, do you have an area away from other animals in your house? Do you have an area away from other animals? Lots of hiding places. We're going to start with picnicking, not, not talking to them. We're going to assess them every day. We're going to set up a camera in their room. We're going to then start working on building a relationship. I have 10 special needs, all were feral about a year to socialize. Cool. Um, and that's the other thing. So 
if you if you have 10 cats right now i probably wouldn't bring another cat into that environment but in the rescue it's hard to say with that little bit of context if it's appropriate or not but if you're going to do it it's going to take a lot of time and i recommend using the behavior modification techniques that i use like be going at the kid's pace keeping them below threshold using clicker training and avoiding the whole, I'm just going to wait them out. I'm going to feed them occasionally. Because a lot of people as a behavior consultant, they're like, the cat socialized. And I'm like, there's a bit, that's an interesting definition I hear a lot. Like, Sterling really right. knows how I feel about that word. That's another word that I don't think people really understand. Because my definition of socialized is not a cat that is hiding most of the time that chills in the basement. My definition of a cat is a cat that is not afraid of new things. Right. Um, goes to the door when people arrive. Like my definition of socialization for a cat is very different than a lot of people are like, he lets me pet him when he's eating. That's not <laughs> socialized. So again, that's a whole nother thing, but it, it's a, it's a complex thing, but that's so great what you're doing. It sounds like you're doing really good stuff and you already have an idea, but I would definitely check out my website. Thank you for so, doing it. Yes. So, so Tabitha, are you saying that a lot of, or many cats that aren't feral, that people have as pets are not socialized? Yes. I don't think it's a hot thing at all. Um, I think I tell people this all the time. I Sterling knows because it's like my thing. Um, I think like I do kitten kindergarten, um, whether it's a feral cat. Now, if it's a feral or fearful cat, first I start with building a relationship and then and then getting them comfortable with me and touch. Then I get them comfortable with other textures and tactiles and smells and other people. Again, like a dog, we think of puppy socialization, right? But then with cats, yeah, I don't know why you guys, but no one, no one thinks about it. And like, there's a there's a reason why cats don't do well when you go on vacation and have house soiling or cystitis and have medical issues due to stress. It's because they weren't appropriately socialized. Because that's a word that gets yeah. thrown around, just petting the cat when they eat that <laughs> socialization. But again, that's a whole nother, I do a lot of stuff. I have a lot of resources on that, but it's not as simple as food, water, I pet you, uh -huh. you're socialized, yeah. right? And, and then back to the question where that I asked, asked actually about like a, an overarching institution, there's actually a Facebook group called Feral Cat Rescue. Thank you Twin Tories for bringing the, this up. Um, helping feral and stray cats, and then you can post where you're from, or like your area, and then people from the same area will connect with you. So that so is, that's really good. I was, I, I didn't should have mentioned that because I'm probably in a million Facebook mm -hmm. cat groups, and that's yeah. a, <laughs> it's definitely a good resource too if you um looking to start a group or you looking yeah. for help or looking for information. Uh, it's a lot of crazy things on the internet. And social media but that's a good thing are the cat groups the facebook mm -hmm. groups um like i said i'm in like a million of them and they are really helpful it's a lot of them where you can get information help and again working together is a thing you may have somebody that can help with the transportation you have somebody over here that can help with the sheltering or building outdoor shelters for cats so working together mm -hmm. is great and the facebook groups yes twin twenties that is an awesome Awesome thing, yeah. That's that's the thing to do. And then we have a very specific question that 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 Katie asked about, um, you know, cats who take them for for TNR. I suppose they check their their teeth. They have to remove their teeth. I, are they a good candidate to be released um, back? Does it even matter? Does it not matter? That's a beautiful question. I'll be honest. I I would still release that cat back um, because thankfully, amazing job getting them TNR because. Dental pain is no joke. Oh my God, is it horrible and super common in cats. Um, so that cat's actually gonna feel a heck of a lot better. And cats usually, he could, the cat, they can still eat fine. Usually they just ingest their food and not chew it anyways. So there are some situations where it, it may not be best to let a cat outside. And I've dealt with a few clients where the cat was, had chronic arthritis and was blind. So in that case, the cat was older, but we worked together and came up with a behavior plan. So again, there's a plan. It's not just bring this cat in my house. I'm going to feed them occasionally. They'll get socialized over two years. It's we have a plan and we're basing it on this cat's body language. We're changing up what we have to do because she brought in a senior cat because of him 
there were so many medical issues. It wasn't safe for him to go back out. And now it makes me cry, but he's like amazing. But this client did everything I asked her plus more. Um, and he's living his senior, super senior life um, in a nice, safe place. But he was blind and had chronic arthritis. But with this exception, low to no teeth, I think that that would be totally a okay to release back. And they're pro most vets will probably do a convenient shot, maybe, and um, recommend they go back out. Yeah. And um, I'm just scrolling through all these questions, uh, trying to trying to answer as many as possible. Someone was asking about a cat that they're keeping in their bathroom, but I, I can't find it now. Um, just a lot of comments about how great you guys are, about thank you for educating people. Um, some people asking where they can contact you. Um, we already shared your two websites, but if you want to maybe like, just explain how you work, can people hire you on like an hourly basis or how did, like, if they just have questions about TNR, about behavior, how do they reach you? You can go first, sir. Well, with me, I actually do a lot of people. Um, you could email me, go to trapkinghumane.org, email me. I do TNR, but keep in mind, please keep in mind, if I don't get back right away, I do actually travel the country doing this. So I'm I'm usually out TNR and educating like all the time. So if you give me time, I definitely will respond and try to get out. Um, but again, I'm traveling the country. But even like I said, even if not me, still Facebook groups. Um, if you just want to follow me and get some information, I'm on Facebook, Instagram. I'm probably always doing everything cats. If you go to my Instagram or Facebook page, it's everything cats, probably a bunch of fur in my beard. So, <laughs> but I do, I'm, I'm constantly working, constantly doing TNR and always trying to shine a light on other people doing it as well. So yeah, trapkinghumane.org. Trapkinghumane.org. And then I, um, I do own a cat and dog behavior consulting business and I teach a lot. So I, I'm speaking at HSUS Expo and I speak at quite a lot of conferences because education. Oh yeah, me too. Oh yeah, we both were at Expo. Yeah, we tripped. Yeah, <laughs> um, they're going to be mad at it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the best. So many events. So both me and Sterling lecture a lot. Um, I do, I actually do clicker training workshops, fear free handling workshops. Okay. Kitten socialization workshops because fearful kitten socialization is something that is very um, deep to me because so many of us are, there's not a lot of great, great resources out there. Even if you're awesome and trying to find the best stuff, um, a lot of force and flooding is what's recommended. And we all know that that not the best there's better ways which is awesome um so i do offer consulting services for behavior or like i work with quite a few rescues with individual problem cats so more intense behavior mod where we need the context and they might need to again ask for help right they might need to work with me to help with a cat that's fighting or something like mm -hmm. that we work together um to figure that out and then I, I do tons of educational events like this, Instagram Live, Facebook Lives. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram. And you can do all that virtual. If someone wants to uh, work with you, it can be done virtually. Yes, I, I'm from Ohio. And with the pandemic, I do, I've been doing mostly things virtual. But I tend to see people from all around the country. Um, since so many amazing veterinarians and other people recommend me in states that I don't live, bless you. Um, yeah, I am happy to help. And just like Sterling, I do get quite a lot of emails. I do book, I work for myself. So I do my best to, to do everything because I'm working and then also doing things like this, which is great. Yeah, and thank you so much for doing that. Uh, I found I found those two more questions. There's, there's more. Um, someone fosters Siamese for their TNR, but uh, you, can, you can read the question. Basically the question is what to do. They still hiss at me, they're in the bathroom uh, by themselves. So the fact that you said I can hold them, that's a very good observation. You can hold them, but do they like it, right? So that's where what happens is we hold them and sometimes we can misunderstood that, oh, they're, they're enjoying this, but actually they're frozen in fear. Mm -hmm. So again, the last thing I do is when I'm socializing fearful kittens or feral, fearful, any, because it's a, a lot of the same, where I meet them at their own pace, I would start with picnicking. I would stop touching them. That's my biggest thing. I tell so many clients, part of my behavior plans is do not touch your cat for two weeks because I don't think we realize how much 
we misunderstand cats by accident. Um, oh, yeah. and we force contact. So like, we don't wait for the cat to initiate contact. That's the cat giving me consent. This, the cat smelling and walking away. No disrespect to me, but that wasn't them giving me consent. So you can imagine what happens with kittens. And this, this isn't specifically with Bernadette, but what tends to happen is people see cats or small kittens and they're like, they might be frozen in fear or their body language might be a little more subtle. So people tend not to, again, not maliciously, but not see it. And they're like, no, con no consent, force, force pets, force pets. <laughs> they let me hold them. They let right. me. I mean, I'm not going to let a guy do a lot of things to me, but they'll still do it, you know? And I know that sounds weird, but con consent is a really big thing with cats and when with all animals. And when you start reading their body language and going at a pace they're comfortable with, the changes you get is just mm -hmm. crazy. So what I would do, Bernadette, is um, I would stop holding them, as you probably picked up on, right? And then I would start with back, back up a step. So I would go to that handout, because again, the handout I have just has everything. It's literally a guide. But I would start with picnicking, building a relationship, creating a comfortable environment, which you probably already have in your bathroom. And then I literally have step-by-step -step based on what the cat's offering. So it's not after, because another thing is a lot of people are like, it's been a week where I hear people say, like someone might say, this cat will be socialized in three to four weeks. And that's chaos. Because you can't, that's like saying, drink this tea and your cancer will be cured, right? right. <laughs> um, all cats are individuals. That's why we love them so much. And then amazing fosters feel horrible. And I'm like, you're doing great. You're not, there's no time, like, there's no set time limit. And when I ask people where they get these numbers from, they can't tell me. So I don't mm -hmm. really know, because again, I, I, I want to understand, like, I don't want to judge, but you'd be surprised. I would just break it down a little bit more. And if they're hissing, that means that's a pretty strong sign that they're uncomfortable. So that means we went ahead too many steps. Mm -hmm. and we have to go back to a step where they were showing minimal to no signs of stress again. And, um, and Love it. that's the same with a lot of pets, actually, right? Cats and dogs and, and you know, if you have other pets and humans, <laughs> to be honest. Don't force, don't force or use sledding on a human. Yes. <laughs> yes. We um, love humans too. There is a question about feral sanctuaries. Um, what do we think about them? What do we know about them? Um, low to no interaction with humans. Is this like a specific um, term? Uh, I I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm actually in the process of experimenting with that. I, I don't want to say experiment, but um, if you all know Milo's Sanctuary, of course, uh, we've I've been working. I've been working with Michelle, and they're building what we're calling the Trap King Feral Fortress. Uh, oh, wow. Taking donations for that now, and it's for feral. So, um, I, I don't want to tell you something I'm not. 100% on just yet, but we are mm -hmm. working with that. So I'll have more information about that uh, on my Instagram and my website soon because we are in the pro. I mean, it's built like we got the area mm -hmm. and everything, and we putting the finishing touches on it. Uh, and that's Milo Sanctuary. That's the Trap King Feral Fortress. So I'll nice. have some more information on that soon. And Milo Sanctuary, for those of you who don't know, it's it's obviously a, a sanctuary, a cat sanctuary. They're just um, outside of Los Angeles. And um, we've worked with them for several years, um, you know, like doing little events together, donating proceeds from, from our events and sales. And they specialize in special needs cats in providing sanctuary to cats that are um, not able to be adopted. And they recently, um, well, recently, beginning of the pandemic, moved to um, a much bigger space just outside of LA. They have this really, really big, beautiful place now. So I'm, I'm excited to hear about oh. that. And I got to, since we're talking about Milo's, I got to uh -huh. shout out my homie, Phoenix Flame Paws. That's a baby with uh, Milo's <laughs> Sanctuary that I sponsor. So, hey, Phoenix Flame Paws. And I'm going to give you some virtual chin rubs if Milo's is in here. That's for Phoenix Flame Paws. <laughs> okay, Phoenix Flame Paws. We'll do that. And we'll, we'll put that in there. Is that the name of a cat that Milo's has? Yeah, that's the name of the cat at, of a cat at Milo's Sanctuary that I sponsor. Cat. <laughs> and uh, we, um, since we're local, we're from Los Angeles. We also um, work with Fix Nation. Fix Nation is is an amazing local organization, um, founded by by a fantastic couple with with the sole aim of spaying and nurturing cats. 
um, feral cats, so trap new to return, and they actually have a veterinarian um, on site, and they listen to this. They fix, well, spay and neuter over 100 cats per day. So they bring Shout them out. in. The evening, Shout um, out to Fix Nation. I went. Out, I was able to go out there with Catman in West Oakland, and we did some trap, some TNR work with uh, Fix yeah. Nation and uh, Lux Paws. Oh, Lux Paws, yeah, yeah, yeah Lux Paws too. Jackie, so, if you're listening. Oh. There's a lot of fantastic organizations, um, a lot of amazing people, just like you two. Um, we have all the links in the comments. We'll post the links in the caption, the links to, to Trap King's website, the, li the link to Tabitha's, the chirps and chatter. Can you explain the name, Tabitha? Yeah. <laughs> so cats are misunderstood a lot, and I see dogs too, but I um, everyone that is familiar with me, not many people work with cats. Uh, on the behavior standpoint, unfortunately. Um, so I'm more well known for the stuff I do with cats and cheer ups and chatter are two cat sounds. Oh. Um, so chatter is when your cat is looking out the window and it kind of sounds like they're, they're, chatter they're chattering and it either, we still not completely sure why it happens. It might be due to frustration or they might be simulating the sounds of their prey. Oh, okay. Um, or chirp up is when your cat, like when you come home and your cat goes up to you, I can't throw my R's, and they go, Wah! and it's like the sweetest little thing. So, yeah, that's where my name, a lot of people are like, birds? I'm like, I love birds, <laughs> but those are two cat sounds. <laughs> oh, uh, since you, wait, before you, you just brought up birds, you know what I'm about to say. Yes, I, I do. I just want to slide this in real quick. Because we're talking about TNR, cats, and now birds. Bird okay. people, we are on the same team. We love you. I have heard a lot of people like, oh, my goodness, you out there with them cats, so you hate birds. No, 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 no. A proper TNR program helps birds. So mm -hmm. uh, controlling, humanely controlling the population will also help the birds. So I, I just wanted to throw that in there because I get a ton of emails from bird people a day who think that I don't like birds because I love oh. cats. Uh, I love birds. I love all animals. That's yeah. The point that's, of being vegan. There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of research out there that is a little faulty uh, and heavily biased, which is interesting that these research papers get published. Mm -hmm. So you tend to see the headlines, but if you actually read the research paper, and this is me being a behavior nerd, but it matters. Their studies are flawed. So a lot of the 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 things that I see people using to scapegoat. Again, I'm not about scapegoating any animal, but to scapegoat cats, a lot of it is not true. Um, and then also, I love birds too, and TNRing and feeding cats on a regular schedule help with that. But also, unfortunately, us lovely humans are the biggest um, farmer of animals and right. birds. So I love people's concern, but there's so much you can do on Earth Day um, so many things that you can do to help birds in your area. Cause unfortunately I love us humans, but we are, we've been doing some weird stuff. So right. when people are scapegoating cats. I'm like, I love that you're concerned. I empathize with them. I provide them with resources. And again, I listen, but then I also say, here's three things you can do to help the birds in your, your world. So good. Absolutely. Well, it's all about the balance and yeah, we love all of you. No on right. Earth Day, we talk about balance, and and it's unfortunately always the humans that destroy the balance. Um, it's and, us. Yeah, it's always us. You know, we went. Good to be self-aware. We're trying to be better, you guys. Earth Day, right? Yeah. Exactly. And you mentioned you guys are vegan. You know, like the food choices we make, the all these choices that we make, they're for for the environment. And then Sterling, I've got your. Um, your website, I think, somewhere too. Let me just find it. We've got Trap King. Oh yes, trapkinghumane.org. Definitely. I want. I hope y'all go check it out. I have some pretty cool events coming up. One of them being next month. Uh, we're having what we're calling a care dare. Oh yeah. Where I um I intend to set the record for the most cats TNR by one person in a 24 hour period. <laughs> and I want to set that record. I'm doing this in hopes to um, me and my uh, 
one of my sponsors, Care, the Care Organization. Shout out to Care if y'all listening. But we'll we'll be doing this because it's the record that I'm setting and I'm hoping that it's broken over and over and over again, especially during kitten season, to raise awareness about TNR Community Cat Care. Hopefully, get more people engaged, especially you fellas, fellas, y'all tough guys that think. You're not supposed to have cats. You got to have a dog. I need you to get out there, get your cat on, get your trap mm-hmm. on. So <laughs> we're hoping with the care there that we get more people engaged, involved in TNR. And I'm daring people to out trap the king. So when I set this, I'll be looking for people to be out there breaking that record. Love it. Out trap the king. I kind of feel like this should be like our end thing. Out trap the king. Black. Um, <laughs> the <end> you know. <laughs> Role models, both of you, and um, just kind of as a conclusion, base boss, we're we're not doing TNR, but we are doing a lot for feline health. And since we talked a little bit about dental health with feral cats, actually dental health is a huge problem with all cats. Um, Tabitha, you will know that most people are scared of touching their cat's mouth. And by the time you notice that something is wrong with your cat's teeth or gums, it's usually super, super late. And the whatever dental or gum disease or you know mouth disease mouth problems they have is is very advanced often requires surgery anesthesia um very expensive very unpleasant and it's painful for the cat it could be painful for months so we have a new test um it's the same cheek swab test that we do for dna but now it's for dental health so um, if you go on our website, uh, baseballs.com, you'll see a special dental dental test. Um, you'll send us the, the kit back, you swab your cat's cheeks, send it back, and you'll get results about on a, that will tell you your cat's predispositions to three main dental conditions. We're talking halitosis, which is often a sign of something deeper, right? We're talking we're talking tooth resorption, which is a a, a, a huge problem, and, and basically means that your cat is most likely going to lose most or all of its teeth. It's very, very, very painful. Very painful. And then periodontal disease, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and it's, you know, affects up to, I believe, 80% of cats. So um, check out our dental test. Um, just a little, oh, look at this cute, look at Flip Flip Hooray. Hoodies too. Oh, that's dope. <laughs> that's dope. I haven't seen it's that. cute, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're coming I love in. one. Oh my God, I love it. I'm so excited about this test, you guys. Face Boss is doing so many cool things they didn't even ask me to say this but it's just really really cool to see an organization because again i love my dog medicine i love cat medicine and i hate to say it but cats have been scapegoated for a long time even yeah. by i love you cat people but sometimes from cat people um so i'm it's so cool to see more pain medications being available more testing like this being available. And I really appreciate Base Paws and all the amazing people that work here to create this stuff because right. cats need it, y'all. Yes. Yes, yes. I've had some dental scares with my baby, so yes. yes. <laughs> I saw Thank the red you. gums and I was like, oh. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is, it's, it's a big thing. And we're really hoping that it's going to change, you know, the way we understand cat dental health. I think we hope we are educating, you know, the entire 2021, we've tried, we've tried to educate cat parents on, on how to take care of their cat's mouth how to check it how to how to like see um if something is wrong and it comes down to again behavior you know how do you know if your cat is in pain you have to understand their body language because cats are great at hiding pain so it all kind of ties ties together you know um and you guys thank you so much uh we hope to have you back yeah um, we'll definitely be your, your record trap king uh your record setting yeah, but- uh, Tabitha, we follow you always anyway on, on, on social media. <laughs> we love you. Um, and uh, any questions, we're here. Thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Happy Earth Day. Thank you all so Happy much. Earth Happy Earth Day. Earth Day. <laughs>